Thank you very much, Juan, and thanks to the co-chairs of uh, today's meeting for giving, giving us the opportunity to report to this um, HCPWP, PCWP uh, meeting um, on this collaboration between regulators and HDAs. Thanks to uh, Kaiser, Ulrich and Juan yeah, for having us, uh, giving us some space here. Um, and as you were saying, Juan, to focus on the element of access. And I think maybe I should just from the outset, of course, be very clear that in the discussions we are having now, we are going some way towards the axis, but not the full way down. Meaning we are talking about the regulatory HDA interface, but of course we all acknowledge that uh, there is a lot of national decision-making to come ultimately to access. And I think that's, I just wanna uh, present as a, as a prerequisite. Um, and and the, the second element is, however, to say, and, and Juan, you were mentioned in the beginning, there is a lot of movement on the European space as to how much we can bring different decision-makers together. Um, and we can bring them together on their evidence needs. Um, evidence is what is supporting uh, different types of decision making. And the principal understanding is that the closer we get evidence um, requirements integrated into evidence generation plans prospectively, the better we can also support subsequent decision making and allow um, that there is less of a disruption along the decision-making chain. That's the way maybe I would phrase it. So we're looking at all this in the next 20 minutes or so from the pan-European perspective, no, noting though that there is of course uh, a national decision-making subsequently, but with the um, new work on the horizon through um, a consortium, which was mentioned by um, by Juan already, and most importantly, I would say, a HDA regulation, which is about to be signed into law um, and coming into force after an implementation period, and really facilitating through a sustainable network what we have been doing over the past more than 10 years now with at the HDA regulatory interface in a project mode, this is really something where we should look forward to um, and set the scene through the work that we have done so far. I'm very happy to give this overview to this group together with Bruno Sipoch, the vice chair of CHMP, because as um, Juan was mentioning, it is of course key that the licensing committee by the agency uh, and its members um, are fully engaged in, in this work here because it is really about transitioning of decisions along a chain. Now, with this brief introduction, let me go into a substance matter. If we go to the next slide, um, really just to um, start by saying that since 2010, um, the agency has now been working together with the European Network um, for Health Technology Assessment short UNETA um, on topics of mutual interest. It started uh, in the area of um, the um, EPA, in fact, the European Public Assessment Report, um, where we were called by a high-level pharmaceutical forum initially to see that this can become a reference document um, for subsequent decision making, but then also worked very swiftly in the area of parallel scientific advice and so on, and expanded over these 10 years, 10 plus years, I should say by now, into various areas of, of mutual interest. It was facilitated um, through uh, the joint actions which brought together the HDA bodies. Um, and the last H, uh, joint action finished in May, 2021. Um, it says here future work arrangements are currently being established this means, and, and you are certainly familiar, um, there is a new consortium amongst HDA bodies uh, to deliver on a service contract um, issued by the European Commission. And this consortium is called UNETA 21, 
Um, so it is um, maybe name wise, it is very close, but concept wise, it's very different because this is really a consortium delivering on a service contract, whereas previously it was a project under John Action. Um, and this service contract lasts for 24 months. But we have been asked um, at EMA to work together with United 21, the now identified consortium. Uh, to continue delivering at this HTA EMA interface um, and even uh, work on a work plan. And uh, Bruno will later give you already some ideas, some perspective, what could be part of such work plan, which is yet to be developed in detail. The aim of all this work is really um, to build synergies between regulatory evaluation and HTA, HTA along the medicines life cycle and when I'm emphasizing this, it's already the notion that it mustn't stop with a single decision making like licensing and then HDA, but there is updates which need to be produced, JCAs, joint clinical assessments need to be updated, um, post authorization work is coming in to fulfill obligations, um, extension of indications coming in, you name it. So it is really across the medicines life cycle that we need to work out these interfaces very carefully. Now, on the next slide, you see that we have already developed a lot over the past years, and we had uh, two work plans so far. The second one was 2017 to 2021, and we reported um, in May this year about the deliverables of this work plan, which finished obviously with the um, closure of John Action 3. And you see here the topic areas which we have identified. And what I'm going to do now in the next couple of minutes is to guide you through the achievements, but also the learnings we have taken from this time um, in working together over these four years. Um, the, work, the, the report is published. You can find the hyperlink here on this slide um, for further reading. If we go to the next slide. Now let's go seven slides through the various achievements. The first one, as I said, it's really the basis of, of many things here. It's the work on scientific advice on early dialogue. Um, other terms are parallel consultation and the future term will be joint scientific consultation, parallel EMA HTA. So that's gonna be an evolution of names. The concept is always the same. It's about prospective planning of evidence uh, generation um, in view of uh, the fact that it needs to generate evidence that can be used by both HTAs and regulators. Under the Joint Action uh, 3, or along this work plan, we have um, developed a single process for what we then called parallel consultation, and we had 31 consolidated procedures being completed, 28 individual ones, two consultations on registries, and also a parallel consultation and qualification. So more than 60 of such procedures to go through. Um, and this is an important learning. It is a learning, of course, for the individual programs, but it's also a very important learning for us as a system, I would say, um, to establish what could be the future working operations between um, regulators and HDA bodies under the um, regulation which is about to be signed into law. Now, looking at reflections, um, the demand from developers has definitely exceeded the capacity um, by the uh, by the, the HDA colleagues um, and this this was also due to elements such as final financial resourcing. Imagine still John Action 3 was a project work um, in this particular, and then therefore we need to keep in mind um, also the financing that was behind it. Um, UNETA had also paused parallel consultation for some time due to COVID reprioritization. Um, and um, we have done, however, a lot of work still to optimize our templates and procedures um, in order to implement some of the HTA requirements, uh, for example, around the discussion of the PICO, um, which is so key for any uh, HTA later to discuss very carefully 
the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. That's what PICO stands for. If we go to the next slide, from initial licensing, we need to quickly think, of course, about post-licensing data generation. That's, again, so key in the work. We had a parallel consultation on registry qualifications. We had specific recommendations on post-licensing evidence generation um, and specific um, consultations. Again, this topic of post-licensing evidence generation in all its different facets has enriched so much over the years. Registries are one of the many cornerstones in this area. Um, but here, I would also say we have had most of the exchanges so far. And we realize that this is important and we really need collectively to get better in order to um, have registries which serve different purposes. But it's also, we need to stimulate industry or developers to think early about the importance of post-licensing evidence generation. And this is why we have published um, together this scientific article, which is linked here, which talks about the regulatory and HTA advice on post-licensing evidence generation. And it's been written um, as, a, as, a, as an outcome of a discussion between HTAs, regulators, and industry to really bring this topic to the forefront and I think it had made some inroads in, in, in this regard. Um, but still, and this goes to the reflections, we want to see more proactive proposals from developers for discussion in parallel consultation. Um, we identified that the flag requirements should uh, become a stronger discussion point when we look at joint relative effectiveness assessment, which is the actual decision uh, which I'm going to come back in a second. Um, and we need to uh, further collaboratively work on registry methodologies, which we identified as priority. Now, moving on, if we have uh, on the next slide presented um, already had the, the discussion on the evidence generation, processing evidence generation, then we come to the time of actual decision making, meaning Regulators come to licensing, HDAs come to a relative effectiveness assessment, or as it's called in the future, joint clinical assessment or JCA. And in this context, we have also worked a lot during Joint Action 3, in fact, um, to optimize uh, this interface whereby we have, from a regulator side, uh, developed and um, provided the a CHMP assessment report um, early to HDA colleagues to perform their joint RIA um, in time. Uh, we have facilitated webinars between um, HTAs and, and regulators, meaning the actual assessors to discuss the strength of evidence for HTAs to ask um, also um, further background, for example, of, of certain discussions which were held. Um, and that was really, really, I would say, successful. Um, and we have also identified how we can further optimize the regulatory assessment report. So from this, I, I can surely say that there is value of these direct discussions between regulators and HDAs uh, looking at the evidence from their respective remits. The remits can be respected absolutely um, the, the fact that the regulators look at the benefit risk in absolute terms, the HTAs take the absolute benefit risk, but then look at the contextualization in relative terms uh, compared to other technologies out there. Um, but looking at the evidence and understanding each other is hugely important. Um, now, uh, it has also been shown that um, there was some administrative burden um, to do this in a project work um, as we've done and we are therefore very happy to see that the future regulation will enable us through confidentiality arrangements to work easier together between decision makers, meaning HTAs and regulators. Um, and we also can see that we uh, should have further information sessions and trainings. And again, I'll come to an example in a second. Let's go to the next slide to um, 
go to the identification of the treatment eligible population. Now, this is, again, so key as a starting point for HDA. What are they looking at in terms of the treatment population when they're comparing to other technologies? So there needs to be clarity of the approved patient population for which there is a positive benefit risk ratio. And therefore, we have been working on the guide to assessors uh, from the EMA side in order to um, optimize how indication wordings look like. But this is really stimulated by the discussion with HDAs. We've also worked on uh, reflections uh, regarding the use of extrapolation, um, or as it is called in the HDA word, evidence transfer, um, a term which I actually think is, is very good, um, because it really um, builds the bridge to the fact that this, this methodology uh, rests on existing evidence, which is then transferred into a different space. And we had also respective workshops, for example, in the area of pediatrics. Now, further reflection showed us uh, we can, of course, always become better with the SMPC. And we are going to look at the section 5.1, which information um, should be in there. We continue um, getting feedback on labeling and EPAS from colleagues um, from the HDA side. And we also look at the um, uh, concepts such as extrapolation. Moving on to the next slide. On orphan medicines, um, which is of course a very important and sometimes sensitive area, we have done a piece of work together with HJAs to better understand how significant benefit, which by, by its very remit and in principle, is comparing uh, the orphan medicinal product to other technologies, how this is comparing um, to a, a relative effectiveness assessment. And we've actually published about our findings because I think it's a very important piece. This is, you could say, the area where regulators get the closest to what HDAs are actually doing. Now, in this context, also important, we have developed the concept of the Off Medicines Maintenance Report, as you are aware. Uh, and again, this has been discussed a lot with the HDAs in order to see that this is also useful for them. Um, we have uh, participated in a discussion about the unmet medical need. Again, an important one to see the different stakeholder perspectives. You can find here the link to the publication. Um, and we have worked on horizon scanning. Improved understanding from all participants about different concepts uh, relevant for orphan medicines was again mentioned over and over. And I think it's very important to continue this conversation also to see, particularly the OMA, how we can further uh, enrich this work. And equally, the concept of unmet medical need is so enshrined and is now in, in, in intense discussion also in the context of the pharma strategy. Moving on. We have on the next slide um, the patient and clinician engagement. And of course, this is extremely close to the heart of the audience here, um, where um, there was mutual learning regarding patient engagement practices in assessments. So um, HDAs um, through UNETA and also EMA colleagues uh, have ex exchanged here, and you have had previously presentations on this. Um, we have provided contacts for targeted consultations. We had also contributions to the scientific advice to patients. Uh, there was commenting on guidances and also the work uh, on clinical sure. methods. Sure. There is um, further collaboration uh, regarding patient expert engagement also in the future, um, focusing now on sharing respective practices and experiences. This will be something which we're going to do also in terms of methodology enhancement under the, uh, together with the consortium. Um, and we will also take particularly up the discussion on better utilization of patient reported outcomes. To close this review on the last slide, just to mention um, a few population intervention specific topics. The discussion on principles of benefits assessment of pediatric medicines was also discussed uh, with the colleagues. And again, a hugely important topic um, we have uh, worked on personalized medicines and companion diagnostics, and also ATMPs have been in the focus and there have been training sessions together. Now, all these topics are very specific and yet they require sufficient attention. 
And that's why they, um, to the extent possible, need also their reflection in, in future work plans. And this, for me, is a nice segue to hand over to Bruno Seporch to give us um, a view on how this collaboration that we've experienced so far can proceed and can further develop in the future. Bruno, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Michael did the, the hard part, so I now have the pleasure of um, explaining a bit and, and guide you through the future actions. As, as you know, this uh, we had our last bilateral um, meeting um, this year, and there was an agreement already um, to uh, prioritize areas for the next uh, collaborative work that will be established. Overall, the goals remain the same. We want to keep uh, collaboration that will, in the end, improve efficiency and the quality of processes. Of course, as Michael said, we, we have to continue to respect the different remits of the de decision makers, and this is sort of the basis of what we, we do uh, when we collaborate with HTAs. And again, we continue to ensure that we have a mutual understanding and dialogue on the scientific evidence uh, needs. Um, and this is why um, we believe that by continuing this project in the, the, this work, we, we certainly will, will contribute to a facilitation of access to medicines and patients in the European Union. Next slide, please. How will we do this? Well, after all that was achieved, and, and as Michael has just guided the, through the, Michael has kindly put this into seven slides, but as you can imagine the amount of work and the tremendous amount of collaboration that is behind those, those seven slides. But that, if, if we achieved all of that, we can only expect more from this kind of interaction from this group. So we have divided for future collaboration some priority areas into um, different types of work, product specific work, methodologi methodological work that has to be developed and operational work. In terms of product specific work to the left side of, this, of the panel, you will see that will be again um, uh, pursuing joint scientific consultation on evidence generation, including the post-licensing evidence generation as previously um, alluded by Michael. We would like to continue the exchange of information on the respective assessments of medicinal products by regulators and HTA bodies. Um, also, the evidence planning and assessments for ATMPs, which is a constant um, uh, matter of discussion, as you all know, and is of extremely relevant. In terms of methodologies, it's time, as Michael also mentioned, to, to study methods and guidelines for the integration of real-world evidence um, in what we are doing, including for registries. Also, um, the generation of patient-relevant data and information that can help support decision-making. And, of course, extremely important also for our pre-licensing assessment, the extrapolation and evidence uh, um, transfer as tool to support the assessment in smaller populations. And this is extremely relevant, as you know, for rare diseases, but not only for rare diseases in, in situations where you have smaller populations of patients, even in, in more prevalent diseases, of course. In terms of operational work, we'll continue, we'll continue the optimization of the regulatory outputs, uh, the methodologies for engagements uh, of patients and healthcare professionals, the practices in the context of companion diagnostics that is now under, um, we are having long discussions and it's part of, of the work plans of different committees, uh, given the interactions we need to have on this regard. Um, and also finally, the horizon as part of the operational work. We have the horizon scanning activities and the preparedness of HTAs and regulatory systems for what's to come. All of this that I just described will be, as in the past, embedded in the work plans of the different committees, and, and we will make sure that we deliver these objectives uh, slowly and to the, to the needs that, uh, that are being identified. Um, but most of all, as I just said, it is important to look um, in the near um, in the next years how we will pursue these objectives. Next slide. So the take-home messages for this uh, presentation is that um, all the work that we've been doing with with a, with UNETA um, and the collaboration and cooperation with EMA has been foundational for everything that we are looking into now. 
um, we have established mutual trust and understanding. And as you all know, this takes time. But we not only did that, we achieved a, a lot, as Michael just mentioned before. So we look forward to what we could achieve in the future. We have established priority areas between us, uh, the regulators, and the HTAs at the European level, as was just demonstrated. The presentation will have links when it's shared, so you will be able to, to see the different technical reports that we are alluding to. So finally, on the 17th of September, the European Health and Digital Executive Agency signed a service contract precisely for the provision of joint health technology assessment work supporting the continuation of the EU coagulation on HTA. And this, and this support and this service contract will be fundamental for the consortium, the UNETA 21, to do their, their work. Um, and this contract will run for 24 months, so until September 2023. So, of course, we expect these deliverables to be delivered in the next two years. So, Michael, um, would you like something? Would you like to add something, or did I did I uh, said everything that I should? <laughs> no, uh, nothing to add from my side. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, back to you, Juan, uh, for the discussion. Happy to have, and I'm pleased to say we are uh, absolutely on time. Thank you.